Deal. <laughs> All right. Hey, Karen Jensen here with VOD Visuals and Matt Fazier, who is the writer and one of the creators of Jack of the Beanstalk here at Abrams Art Center. Hey, Matt. Hey, nice to meet you. Great to meet you, too. I just saw the show. It was so fascinating and so many different forms all smashed together and family and interesting for adults too and it was just wonderful and bizarre and I really want to know what inspired you to create such a, a mishmash of wonderful things. Well uh, the, the, the form of pantomime as we call it this 300 year old theatrical tradition of holiday based fun for the family with a kind of burlesquing of, of popular culture, you know, uh, ribbing the, the high and mighty, having a lot of cross-dressing and things like that. It's very traditional and part of British culture. And I very, very much wanted to bring that to America because I think it's the perfect vehicle for a kind of lightly political, ribald, fun, poke at all the nasty things. And also, um, under this current administration, um, you know, we find, me and Judy find, that children are being encouraged to uh, recognize each other's differences rather than what they've got in common. And we want people to realize that they're part of a community and a whole. They're a member of a whole group. And so the idea that the whole uh, community have to chop down the beanstalk and that it's okay if, you know, you're not... Uh, cis, white, straight, male kind of thing, and all those things that, you know, are considered sort of, oh, only talking to adult people. Well, our kids can take those concepts. You know, it's about love and understanding and self-acceptance, and that's what we want to do, and that's why we brought this show to Abrams. Um, the other aspect of that is that Julie and I are very well known for adult work, and we wanted very much to bring our message of self-acceptance and love and community to a broader family audience. We don't have children of our own, but what we do have are shows, and we give birth to them, just like having a kid, and we are the proudest of this kid more than any other thing we've ever done. Just the hearing the kids scream, um, the kids on stage, you know, Bella and Annabelle and Dylan and, and Nate and, and all the others and Oliver, um, breathe they're also wonderful it, it just fills us with a huge uh, fulfilled um, feeling of love community and exactly what we set out to do even though we're a little bit in debt <laughs> well there's no better reason to be in debt than to make something this wonderful and 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 this heartwarming and community it was just so so wonderful and funny um, you mentioned Julie who is one half of a couple, but is also one half of your company, right? One of Us. Can you tell us the mission of One of Us? Yeah, we are outsiders with inclusivity at the center of our message. Our mission statement is to poke fun at the absurdity of normality using an artistic cup of loving agitation. We accept you, One of Us. <laughs> I learned that. And it sounded good, right? But it was learned. Um, it sounded great. And, and Julie um, directed. She has the ability to see the whole and the minutiae simultaneously, something a director needs to do. I'm, I just love words and playing with them and songs. So I write. I rewrite the lyrics to all the popular songs. You know, I construct all the terrible jags. We go for quantity over quality. Like, so if you hit them with five bad gags in a row, they'll laugh at the end. But each one singled out would be a groaner, you know. <laughs> and um, Julie's been wonderful directing this fantastic raggle tuggle bunch of people and now she's she's also swing you know in theater terms swing is the is the company member that will play all the roles right. they swing from one role to the other and julie our director is the understudy for everybody in the show so she's currently taking rachel our puppeteer's part playing lucy part of the giant one of the beans growing this you know all of this stuff so um we are a very good unit we our symbiosis, if it were pictorial, would represent the yin and yang. That sounds perfect. Uh, this, this gaggle that you refer to, where did you find your many performers, many of them children, who are excellent, excellent singers, dancers, show people themselves, uh, where did you find them? Well, we did open call for a local open call for the ensemble. Um, and we met a remarkable amount of incredibly interesting characters who live locally, who we're now friends with, but who happen not to be in the show. Um, hi, Bubbles. Uh, anyway, um, and then we asked for principals. You know, we asked specific people to audition for specific roles. We had a bit of a... When we found Jenny Jill, you know, Jenny, who is our Jack, the central theme, the representation of the community, um, and she's an ex-UYT student, urban youth theatre student. Mm -hmm. She lives on Avenue D in the projects around the corner. She's about, and she's come back to play the lead in the major production this year. It's the classic local success story. Mm -hmm. I mean, she embodies the spirit of this entire show. 
Um, and then um, the kids, we auditioned, not open, we had to know that they had some singing and dancing and acting in them. We've got a couple of show kids in there, you know, people who go to special schools for that. But we also got a couple of local kids and we, were, we accepted anybody. I mean, we didn't know that Nate, our fantastic break dancer, I've never seen The Running Man done as well as how Nate does The Running Man. Um, he just came in, did The Running Man and we're like, you're in, you know. <laughs> we had a few, I don't know if you're familiar with the producers, <laughs> Commit. We need commitment. One or the other. <laughs> but um, and look, we we shouldn't look at them while they're eating. It's a bit like a zoo program, then, isn't it? Like one of those old animal programs. And here they are in their natural habitat, devouring the food, and like only hungry actors can do. Here we see the lesser-known child actor tucking into some rice. Yes, rice is all we can afford. The child actors at the end there. Laughing and joking with the cast, Randy Luna, our wonderful choreographer. Everybody checking their phones, no doubt to see the successful text messages of how much their friends enjoyed the show. Basil Twist in the scarf there, talking to Viva Concini. He made our giant and fixed it. And then over, as we swing past the local art, we see our director nursing her broken finger, our child wrangler, and our stars. Not least of which, as I go to stand behind the wonderful Michael Johnny Lynch, the dame the center of this show. Without a good dame, this genre of theatre does not work. And we found the dame of dames. Who knew that that very clipped British, oh, don't you mind, never mind over there, kind of very English style, yeah. would translate to ghetto drag lady, right? I mean, like, she's, well, oh my, she's so amazing. Michael Johnny Lynch is a godsend to us. You know, when, now that was a moment, I was talking about the producers and the famous casting scene in the producers. Mm -hmm. Michael Johnny Lynch walked in, opened his mouth for like a minute and we were like, that's our Hitler. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just, I love him so much. He's so talented and so wonderful. And Silly Simon, the other Brit in the show. Um, he really holds this show together. He was the first person we cast uh, because we knew we needed a Brit who understood the genre along with me. And Matt Rope is a wonderful uh, performer. Um, hey, Julie. Julie, Julie, could you come over? Sure. Well, she needs to eat first, okay? Fair enough. So you can talk to her later. I'm done for a while. Yeah, fair enough. We're here with Julie Atlas Muse, who is the other half of one of us and the director of Jack and the Beanstalk at the Abrids Arts Center and also today played many roles in the piece, including Puppeteer and on and on and on. Um, I just want to hear some things about what is close to your heart with this show, where did the inspiration come from, that kind of stuff. Is there anything you want to add? Matt's been telling us a bit about the piece. Well, I don't know what he said, but this is a pantomime, which is a 300-year-old traditional form of theater in England. In England, there's like six productions in 800-seat houses in London alone that are sold out from the middle of November to the middle of January. So this form of theater exists. And the first time I went and I saw it in England, I was like, holy cow, this is fantastic. It's like punk rock with six-year-olds and grandmas. And it's so much fun. So I thought, let's do one here. So we got fortunate enough to do it. Yeah. It's wonderful. Uh, tell me a little bit about the kind of work that you have done and maybe briefly about some of the kind of work that Matt has done on your own. I know you're both well known for doing it, work for adults, not necessarily what you're doing right now. Um, can you give us a little bit of background about where you come from? Uh, Sure. Oh, I come from Detroit, Michigan. When I was a child, I saw cats. That changed my life. I thought to myself, wow, great makeup, great hair, great dancing, great music. So that made me become a performer when I was about seven years old. But I wasn't able to come full bloom until I moved to New York City in the late 90s. And then since then, I've been working in every spot that I can. Uh, I perform regularly in nightclubs because that pays the bills and gives me total freedom with the best lighting and production ever. And then I do everything from children's theater, family theater, to more extreme adult theater. Yeah. Other question, you guys did a version of Beauty and the Beast, very critically acclaimed, beautiful piece. Um, is there something intriguing particularly about telling stories that are, are well known and really changing them up? I really like telling stories that are, people already know the plot to, because then they can, and, and I like reading stories that I know the story already. Because that way I can just relax on what happens and enjoy the telling of it. 
So for me, especially for this one and for Beauty and the Beast, yeah, we do fairy tales, right? Which are mostly coming of age stories, right? So there's a transformation happening at that time. Um, and to, for, oh, I forgot my, my point. That's all right. We were just talking about fairy tales. I just, I enjoy, I enjoy the, uh, the fact that everybody knows the story. Yeah. And, and then you can put twists to it and turns of it and... I don't know. I think it's it's reassuring. This is very important because the you have to make for a pantomime you have to hit into the feeling of nostalgia for the audience and knowing the story sets them at ease. Having it be in their home sets them at ease. So then we can have all the anarchy that also happens like the pie fights and the ghost gag and you know if you if the audience isn't comfortable then they don't then they don't have the freedom in order to enjoy the chaos and the anarchy and that's the most important part to me. So first get them comfortable and then have a chaotic anarchic time. That's exactly what happened. It was so wonderful. So much audience participation. Everyone was very involved and very secure and comfortable. You're absolutely right. It was a raucous adventure. It was wonderful. Uh, tell us, how long does the show run? Come see it at Abrams Arts Center. The show uh, closes on December 23rd, which is a Saturday. We have 7 o'clock shows from next... Oh. On Sunday, we have a 2 o'clock show, this upcoming Sunday. And then from Wednesday until Saturday, we have seven 7.30 shows every day and a 2 o'clock show on Saturday. So please come on by. Come on by. It's fabulous. Thank you. Thanks a lot.